Hey everybody, thanks for coming. I'm uh, Jordan Charidan with the Young Turks. My channel is TYT Politics. Subscribe if you haven't. Uh, there you go. <laughs> um, and Dr. Jill Stein is joining me here at the Green Party Convention where uh, you are up for nomination tomorrow and uh, likely to be chosen. This would be, uh, you ran in 2012. Um, and we're, uh, so far, uh, you have received the most uh, votes of a woman uh, in, a, in a general election. Um, I wanted to ask first, because the Green Party and third parties are now kind of coming into focus, what the hell is the Green Party? Uh, for people who aren't political diehards, most people in this room are, but if a low information person, it, Green Party, it sounds like trees to me. Uh, tell, tell people who might, might not know what the Green Party represents. You know, the simple way to say it is that the Green Party is a party of, by, and for the people. We are the only national political party that is not poisoned by corporate money, by lobbyist money, and by super PACs. So we have the unique ability to actually stand up and speak out and insist on what it is that the American people are demanding and what we actually need. So you could say we are a party for people, planet, and peace over profit. We're about meeting our urgent needs, and specifically, we are the one party that is calling for an emergency jobs program, which will also solve the emergency of climate change. We're calling for canceling student debt, like we did for the crooks on Wall Street. It's about time to bail out a generation of young people who are held hostage by predatory student debt. Uh, we call for healthcare and higher education actually for free as human rights. And in fact, free higher education pays for itself. So it's not a question of how we pay for it. For every dollar we put in, we get back seven in return. We call for a welcoming path to citizenship, for an end to this epidemic of police violence uh, and mass incarceration and the war on drugs that all feeds that. Uh, and finally, we call for a foreign policy based on international law and human rights instead of these catastrophic wars based on economic and military domination that are making us more endangered, not more safe. So bottom line is we are a party that can stand up for an America and a world that actually works for all of us. Right. And um, you look at where the media is and where uh, kind of the establishment beltway folks are. If they called Bernie pie in the sky, they're calling you an alien. Because uh, everything you just said, uh, nowadays, uh, the, the status quo folks call uh, not realistic, crazy talk, radical. But a lot of the things you say and Bernie said is kind of like what FDR did, some of the you know, last century's great leaders when the economy was off a cliff, uh, when there were soup lines, these things. And it led to the 1950s, the 1960s, a more equitable time, these things. Uh, obviously, there's been a narrative set that you were radical. Can you explain uh, to people just tuning in why it's not so much you're radical, it's that the narrative has been twisted to make it seem like these things are actually uh, out of the norm? Exactly. And now, you know, we have a Democratic Party, which is really to the right of where Dwight Eisenhower was back in the 1950s. Um, so it's that both of our parties have been hijacked by very big money. And there's this saying from um, uh, the Supreme Court Justice, Louis Brandeis, that we have a choice between vast concentrations of wealth or democracy. And wealth has become more and more concentrated into fewer and fewer hands, and the political parties have continued lurching to the right, becoming more corporatist, more militarist, more imperialist, to the point where, you know, in this election, it's not just what kind of a world we're going to have, but whether we are going to have a world going forward or not. Uh, in terms of the climate crisis, which is barreling down on us, in terms of the new nuclear arms race, which has been uh, promoted actually by actions of the Clinton administration that withdrew uh, 
from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Uh, and then also the Obama administration that has called for a new trillion dollar program in nuclear weapons and modes of delivery. So, you know, and not to mention the expanding wars that know no end that are devouring half of our discretionary budget and just about half of your income taxes are going for these wars that are not making us more safe. Look at what we've accomplished. We've spent six trillion dollars since the 9-11 uh, attacks. Six trillion if you include the ongoing health care needs of our wounded soldiers, uh, which comes out to about $75,000 per American family. It's staggering what we are paying for this, yet what are we getting for it? It's failed states mass refugee migrations, and in fact, worse terrorist threats. Every terrorist threat that we've been fighting since 9-11, whether the Taliban or, or Al-Qaeda or the new threat of ISIS, they're far stronger, they have far more territory, and they are far more vicious than they were before we started fighting them. And in fact, important to remember that the whole terrorist threat really grew out of a US and, and uh, Saudi strategy for defeating the Russians in uh, the Soviet Union at that time in Afghanistan. They created this Sunni terrorist uh, globalized threat to help shore up the Mujahideen, which was the way they were gonna stop the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. It has backfired massively, yet that's all we hear from these two uh, corporate parties sponsored by the war profiteers, sponsored by the predatory banks and the fossil fuel giants. We just get more of these failing policies that now have put us all in the target hairs. So we're saying this is an existential moment right now in this race. It's unlike any other race we've been in before, not only because of the severity of the crises we face, which have proceeded under Democrats and Republicans alike, but it's also the fact that the public has woken up and is standing up and saying, no thank you. We we reject, we repudiate, we dislike, and we distrust these two uh, establishment candidates more than any other presidential candidates in history. The public is clamoring for what we're offering, being an honest broker, standing up as a true alternative to this system that's throwing people under the bus. So if we begin to actually have a real debate, I think we're going to see things move in a very big way. Hold on to your hat. Um, I know you've said many times your stance on the lesser of two evils, so I don't want to go there, but I do want to kind of dig into uh, the difference between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, because how I see it, uh, the first time I could vote was 2004, yeah. so I vo happily voted against George Bush. Uh, in 2008, uh, a lot of people uh, kind of said, oh, this guy Obama's uplifting and hope and change and all these things. Uh, I kind of look at it, Obama versus McCain. I, I don't think Obama's been great, but McCain, probably, I would have been drafted again. We probably would have been in seven different wars. So do you think, in some cases, uh, it, if you're faced with two choices like that, it's better to take, uh, you know, okay, he raised ta Obama raised taxes on the wealthy. We didn't get involved in another war, but we have drones. What do you think in terms of um, someone like McCain and maybe Donald Trump that, pe you know, people are saying, could be a catastrophe versus just another corporate chill. You know, I, I think we have a catastrophe right now. And if you actually compare the policies uh, of the uh, Democratic White House with George Bush, it's hard to say we're better off. You know, Obama fought tooth and nail not to withdraw the troops from Iraq. And it was only George Bush's deadline where the immunity for U.S. troops ended that forced his hand. But we're back, you know, we're, we're back bombing Libya. Uh, we've extended these wars all over the place and there's no sign of them stopping. There are other ways we could proceed. We could, we could establish a weapons embargo because it's our weapons industry that's arming all combatants, basically, on all sides. We could establish um, a peace offensive in, uh, in the Middle East, which is what we're calling for, a weapons embargo and a freeze on the bank accounts of those countries that continue to fund terrorism. Hillary Clinton herself identified the Saudis as still the major funder of uh, Sunni Jihad worldwide. Uh, if you look at the climate, yes, all of the above sounded better than drill, baby, drill, but it turned out to be drill, baby, drill on steroids, actually, because the roof was blown off of fossil fuel uh, extraction. The war on immigrants, you know, 
uh, the 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 Republicans are the party of hate and fear mongering, but the Democrats are the party of deportation and detention, and in fact, night raids. Night raids against who? Women and children who are fleeing from the coup in Honduras that Hillary Clinton herself gave the thumbs up to. So, you know, I'd say the the um, the Democrats do a very good job on on messaging and PR, and they lead people into this false sense of security, like mm -hmm. things are going to be better. Unfortunately, the Democrats sort of fake left, but they keep marching to the right and becoming more militarist, more corporatist, more imperialist, you know, and look at nuclear weapons. And Hillary Clinton wants to start an air war over Syria uh, by declaring a no-fly zone with a nuclear power, Russia, that she's been very engaged in provoking. So. Uh, I will feel horrible if Donald Trump gets elected, but I will also feel horrible if Hillary Clinton gets elected. She has a proven track record, which is really quite a disaster, leading us into the catastrophe of Libya. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's a false solution. The lesser evil doesn't actually solve the problem. The answer, as Bernie Sanders said many times over, is a truly radical, progressive set of policies that meet the needs of everyday people. That's what's lifting up Donald Trump, is this economic misery. And where did that come from, you know? That was NAFTA, brought to us again by the Clintons with Hillary uh, advocating for it and celebrating it, sending our jobs overseas. Now the next thing is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Thank you very much, Democrats, and Hillary, until she waffled a little bit, but she's likely to waffle yeah. back. Uh, or Wall Street deregulation. So that's not the answer. Or or the, the, the crime bill that open the floodgates to mass incarceration, or the attack on aid to families with dependent children, the safety net, uh, and after the Clintons led the charge to destroy that safety net, we have millions more children in poverty. So it's a mistake to think that uh, the lesser evil moves us forward. It's still moving us backward in a way that's just unsustainable, unjust, and absolutely intolerable. We have the power, you know, in the words of Alice Walker, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. If you just look at the number of young people trapped into predatory student debt, that's 42 million. That is a plurality, a winning plurality of the vote. So we need to get the word out, you know, that we the people actually do have the power to come out and take over this election and win it, not only in justice on student debt, but justice for immigrants and justice for workers and justice for women and immigrants and the LGBTQ community uh, and, and racial justice. These are solvable problems, but we actually need uh, elected officials who are working for us, not for the predatory banks and the war profiteers. I want to uh, kind of uh, expand on the student loan issue. Uh, it's not really reported because the media only cares about, you know, Donald Trump as a booger and whatever the latest tweet was. Um, but, I mean, these are being packaged now like the, you know, the houses were. Yes. Uh, and all this crappy uh, bonds and whatever the fancy names are. So it's kind of looming as a bubble. That's but right. uh, let's say... Take away the name Democrat, Republican, Independent, you're elected just because you're great. You're going to be up against uh, a very powerful Republican uh, lobby, the corporate Democrats who haven't given up their ways, the media. Um, I don't want to say how practical is it to forgive all these loans, but practically speaking, how do you kind of break the plutocracy? Because even if you win, I mean, they're not just going to, you know, wave the red flag, the white flag. <laughs> um, how is it practical that you could just erase student debt, you're talking uh, at least a, a couple billion, if not trillion Trillions, dollars. Yes. Yeah. It's 1.3 trillion, which is actually far smaller than the bailout for the banks, which is, you know, 16 trillion, or maybe it's 17 trillion if you add in Mar all yeah. the free all the free money. Maria Bartiromo didn't seem to understand that when you were on the, <laughs> at Fox. They didn't seem to get that. Yeah, yeah. That's right, yes. Yeah. Well, we have a little bit of educating to yeah, do yeah. with Fox, I think. Um, <laughs> But, you know, at least they're talking to us, you know, and, and, and more power to them for that. And, and CNN, and I let's give CNN it. credit Yes, too. let's yeah. give CNN credit, absolutely. We'll be on with them on the 17th. Uh, that's right, yeah. on the 17th, tune in. Um, so, you know, it, it turns out, you know, we, we came up with 
80 billion, I think it was, when the Fed decided, oh, we got to bail out AIG, you know, and boom, there was the money. And then there was trillions of dollars to bail out Wall Street. So they kind of blew their cover. And now we know that we can bail out whoever we think needs bailing out. Now, was it good to bail out Wall Street? The American people were saying, no, don't do it. Don't bail out these crooks. Uh, and in fact, bailing them out just enables them to continue their, their waste, fraud, and abuse and their reckless gambling. That did not stimulate the economy. On the other hand, just imagine if we bail out for a far smaller price, we bail out a generation of young people who are basically, they, they've got their hands tied behind their backs with this predatory debt. They're working two and three part-time, low-wage, temporary, insecure jobs, just trying to keep a roof over their heads. They're not able to pay this debt back. And not only is it a danger to our economy to have this potential bubble that could burst, but this is like the most productive sector of the economy that's been hung out to dry. Let's get rid of that debt and let's allow young people to bring their passion, their skills, their training to the economy of the 21st century. This is the stimulus package of our dreams. There could be no better way to actually jumpstart a true economic recovery and the refashioning of our economy to meet our you know, our needs for clean, green energy and a healthy, sustainable food system and all the rest. We need to bring the ingenuity of the younger generation to bear on our economy. This is the perfect way to do it. And what would you say to, you know, the naysayers that say, well, that, you know, the banks was a crisis, whereas the students, you know, made an agreement and they're, you know, uh, reneging on it. Also, the banks, according to them, according to the government, paid it back. I, I don't know how, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that's completely true. But basically that, you know, mm -hmm. students, I know, unfortunately, this is the system we have. It's very expensive, but you sign the contract and, you know, you can't pull out. I think Wall Street tore up that contract when Wall Street crashed the economy with their waste, fraud, and abuse. And in 2008, they brought the economy down so that those jobs are not there. So that contract has actually been shredded already and the banks got off you know scot-free they got off you know with murder basically economic murder and then some you know real consequences to that economic murder uh, I think what's going on with our younger generation is a crisis in fact this is the elephant in the room because this is a generation that doesn't have jobs they don't have a place to live they have they've inherited an absolute climate crisis which is melting down on their watch the um, scientific agencies now tell us Jim Hansen the foremost climate scientist NOAA the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration they're saying that we have till maybe 2050 or 2060 uh, before we start seeing uh, civilization ending impacts, sea level rise potentially of 10, 20, 30, 40 or more feet, which means goodbye to all our coastal population centers. It also means our coastal nuclear power plants go Fukushima. This is not a hit we can survive. The world cannot deal with 65 million refugees right now from the consequences of predatory war policies that we've been conducting. There's no way that we're going to survive 10 times that. It's said to be 600 million, which will be climate refugees from this first hit. The point is we have a climate emergency going on right now, which is also a generational emergency because, you know, I don't know who plans to be here in 2050, but there are a lot of people from the millennial generation. I would count myself among you as well. You know, I plan to be here uh, to make sure that we're doing this right. In order to do it right, we got to start now. That's how the climate works. This is an emergency to start now. And let me also add, if you look at um, the dropping birth rate in this country, this is a sign of a human rights catastrophe. There is a generation that has basically been um, devastated. You know, they don't have a place to live, they don't have families, they don't have relationships, they cannot think about their reproductive rights. How about their reproductive rights, which are getting absolutely slaughtered right now? So I think uh, there's a terrible misservice disservice that's being done to a younger generation. They should be front and center in our policies and in our plans for, uh, you know, turning this around, ensuring that we have the jobs, getting them out of debt, the right to 
public higher education should be guaranteed. That should be a human right. Throughout the 20th century, we provided uh, a high school education for free because it was essential in order to survive in the economy of the 20th century. Well now, in the 21st century, you need a college degree or some kind of postgraduate degree if you're going to have a fighting chance in this economy. So by all rights, it needs to be free going forward, and we need to right the wrong of this entrapment in predatory student loans when Wall Street crashed the economy. We need to erase that debt. And that doesn't necessarily require Congress. That can be done with the cooperation of the Fed, who bailed out Wall Street. They can bail out a younger generation. Generation. Um, what's, in, what's interesting to me, uh, if you look at Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump kind of wears his douchebaggery as a badge of honor. <laughs> Hillary Clinton, you know, kind of is putty, you know. She was, quote, the progressive who got things done versus Bernie Sanders. This morning I saw an ad uh, against Trump. She's using neocons. She's courting Jeb Bush donors. I mean, I could go on. Uh, plain and simple, do you think she's a liar, Hillary Clinton? Um, well, put it this way. I, I don't think you want to believe what she says. So I'm not looking for a, sa a soundbite. Just for, for people, for, for the media and the revisionists who are making her out to be a champion for the middle class, um, she's obviously changing her position. So... To uh, say the least. Yeah. Yes, I'd say fool me once, shame on you. Fool me a thousand times, shame on me. Um, you know, we again, we saw Hillary, uh, if she's working for the cl middle class, it's the very upper, upper, upper middle class, and the rest of the middle class is kind of joining everybody else who's either in poverty or heading towards poverty. According to the Census Bureau, one out of two Americans is either in poverty or low income and heading towards poverty. So we're not in a good shape, and it's not just the neocons who caused this, it's also the neoliberals like, uh, like the Clintons who gave us, for example, Wall Street deregulation, and that in turn crashed our economy. Nine million jobs went up in smoke. Five million homes were stolen out from under their homeowners. Um, you know, you had the floodgates open to mass incarceration with these uh, horrific uh, three strikes you're out crime bills. Uh, Hillary Clinton worked in Haiti, a country with an abysmal poverty wage. She worked on behalf of wealthy US corporations to suppress the minimum wage and to force it down from an absolutely shocking 60 cents an hour down to a mere 40 cents an hour. And that was the legacy of helping families and children that Hillary Clinton led the way on um, in, in Haiti. So I think we need to be very clear. Who is paying Hillary Clinton's bills? And, and, Don, and uh, her husband's bills, for that matter. They have raised $153 million in private money just from their talks to big, wealthy corporations that paid them hundreds of thousands of dollars per speech. They are not sharing those speeches with us. They have been paid big money for those speeches, and they are receiving big money uh, in their campaign contributions and through their super PACs. So if there is so any confusion about out there about who Hillary Clinton is accountable to, just follow the money, and you will see that that story hasn't changed. Um, the, the media the media hasn't covered uh, much of the problems during this election. You had uh, hour-long lines in Arizona, yes. uh, voters purged in New York. I covered that extensively. Uh, you know, uh, misleading mail going out. Uh, I mean, it, the list goes on and on. Uh, I've done a lot on it. Uh, if you were president, uh, it would be tough to get there. Let's say you even get on the debate stage. Uh, who knows what could happen in the general election? It seems like this whole process, state by state, uh, not, not, not even to mention Iowa, you know, Bernie loses by less than one percentage points. They call it 
before it's even done being counted. That happened in several areas. Yes. Uh, what do you do, at, both as a candidate but as a president, to restore credibility right. into our system? So first, as a candidate, the difference is that um, among the Greens, we have some of the, you know, the most uh, ferocious watchdogs for uh, election integrity. And we will challenge, uh, in fact, we challenged on behalf of the Democrats, you know, to get the recounts done in Ohio and in Florida. So we will be leading the charge and holding uh, the election commissions and the secretaries of state, etc., accountable, and we will be calling for investigations. Uh, and if need be, in advance, we will be doing that work so that this kind of uh, cheating uh, is preempted. Um, we will stand up and fight. And uh, as in office, um, and let me say, if I am lucky enough to serve and we turn the White House into a greenhouse, <laughs> which would make the world a better, safer place all around. But if we do that, you know, we will be, for the first time in history, we will have a president who is not just a commander in chief, but who is an organizer in chief, and who is there to lift up, support, uh, to help inform and empower everyday people to be the, um, uh, to actually be the engine of our democracy, which is supposed to be how it works. It's not supposed to be the lobbyists who are driving policy, but it is, and that's documented by a gazillion studies, if you didn't know it from just looking around. So, you know, we would be there representing a very different game plan. When Barack Obama was elected, he had an amazing set of ground troops that were basically put on the shelf as it became clear that he was accountable to Wall Street, actually, not to everyday people with his appointment of, of uh, Larry Summers uh, and the Wall Street bailouts and the rest of it, the priorities became clear. With us, that's not true. We don't accept the money. We never have. Uh, we are firewalled against that kind of corruption. So we will get there only with the power of the people, and we will continue that power of the people, and the, po the people will have a voice and a home in the White House in order to move forward our agenda for justice. And I uh, kind of want to get to a few lightning round before I get to questions. Uh, I know people that are considering you, but they've been troubled by some things they hear that you haven't been clear on or they're confused by, and now Hillary Clinton, the media are kind of smearing you a little bit. So just plain and simple, yes or no, do you think uh, vaccines cause autism? No. Great. Cleared up. <laughs> she, she. And I say... Read my book, okay? I, I, I was, I'm on the record on this uh, in the first review of the literature that uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility and I co-authored a book on this. We looked at what are some of the drivers of developmental disabilities, and by the way, we must take care of our disabled uh, residents and citizens and not let them and their human rights get lost in the shuffle here. They need support, they need care, they need funding. Um, and they need protection. Uh, but we were very clear when we reviewed the science, looking at what may be some of the public health drivers here. Autism did, I'm, that, I'm sorry, um, vaccines didn't even make it into the list of things that we considered reviewing. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. You can look you, at the evidence. What you have said, uh, which has been distorted, is uh, you have an issue with the regulators. Can you just expand on that? Because those are two separate thoughts. Exactly. Yeah. And what the, you know, this is like the uh, swift boat uh, issue, or, or it's like the, um, uh, the birther issue. You know, this is, this is a nonsense issue that's intended to try to distract people from... Or, or Bernie bros. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah exactly. They're trying to distract people from the real threat of our campaign, which is that we're calling for an economy that works for everyday people and getting the corruption out of government. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're trying to distract with these um, rather ludicrous uh, concocted issues, I must say, that are not really, you know, what's front and center in the minds of the American people? It might, the American people are really not so much thinking about vaccinations and Wi-Fi, you know? The American people are really thinking about jobs. How do I keep a roof over my head? How do I even get health care in order to get my vaccinations, you know? How about that? Um, so this is just a distraction campaign, but the issue that we have called attention to is that we need to trust our regulators. And when you have cases like what happened recently with Vioxx, where, where the FDA sat 
on the scientific studies talk about being anti-science, suppressed scientific information on behalf of the pharmaceutical industry so that hundreds, over 100,000 cases of serious heart disease developed from Vioxx before physicians and consumers knew about the dangers of Vioxx. So if the FDA has a problem, you know, that problem is their credibility. We need to stop the revolving door and we need to stop the campaign contributions. It's something like 700 million in the course of just two years worth of campaign contributions from the pharmaceutical industry. That really biases uh, our regulations. It biases our policy making across the board. We need to stop the revolving door and we need to get the big money out of politics so we can get the people back in. And um, another one that's come up recently, you, you mentioned Wi-Fi and now, now they're saying you say wi being around Wi-Fi is dangerous for kids. Can you clear that up, what you meant? I think that question needs to be cleared up by our regulatory agencies. There are questions that do need to be answered. And I just refer you to the most recent study published by the National Institutes of Health. <laughs> the best study done yet about this question, which is a long-term study, and believe me, I could, I could talk for hours about scientific evidence and what is good and what's not. You can read about it, it's a whole chapter in my book. Um, but let's just say, these are the kinds of questions, this is real science, which should be debated and discussed. There are very difficult trade-offs here that regulators have to make when they think about the risks and the benefits. I love Wi-Fi. I use Wi-Fi. I, I, I live every moment of my life surrounded by Wi-Fi. So, you know, I want to know, and I'm not worried about myself as an adult, I'll tell you, the only questions that have been raised are about young kids. Mm -hmm. So they And you're need saying to that's by the scientific community? Uh, that's right, absolutely, by the scientific community. I am a member of the scientific right. community, okay? She's a doctor. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm a doctor. I've done a whole lot of reviewing of research and looking at evidence. And mm -hmm. believe me, this is not the first time I have gone to battle with our regulatory agencies who missed it on lead. They missed it on lead for almost a century. Hello, we have a lead crisis because the power of the industry was put above our public health. We need regulators that understand the importance of precaution when human lives are at stake. And when there is scientific uncertainty, we need to err on behalf of people, not on behalf of profits. So I want to have a regulatory agency that can make these difficult uh, judgment calls without conflicts of interest. This is a no-brainer. So to be clear, President Stein's not knocking on doors to take away iPhones of adults. You just want more research not doctored by regulators into the effects on children. Uh, that's right. I, I think we should allow the scientific discussion to go forward and then let's deal with, with what we find. But let's not try to engineer the answers in advance because what you hear being said in these arguments are basically the talking points of the industry. Mm -hmm. This is just nothing but corporate spin here. They do not want someone standing up for public health, for our protection. They want to be protecting profits. And lead is the case study of what happens. We have a lead crisis in this country, you need go no farther than Flint, Michigan, but it's not limited to Flint. We've got lead built into you know, our pipes, into our uh, consumer products, in our soil, in our housing. It was emitted for decades after we knew that lead was very dangerous. It took, you know, it took fighting tooth and nail on behalf of the public health community to finally get public health protections from these regulators. We need a new chapter in regulation that puts people over profits. And uh, I want to get to some audience questions. Uh, Thomas Piketty, he's an economist and author, uh, has called for a global tax on wealth to reduce income inequality. Uh, do you support this approach? Uh, yes, I do. A absolutely. And at uh, what, what rate, so you know, the billionaires could start sheltering their money now? Uh, what, 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 what rate would you approach? Yes. I think Bernie called for something like a 2% wealth tax, maybe a little more. Yes. Um, what would you look at? So we have not actually developed the specifics of a wealth tax yet, but I think it's you know it's a very important piece of a shift in taxation. So for example, uh, income tax should be much more steeply graduated. So by the time you're getting up to millionaires, multimillionaires, people who are making a million dollars in a year or more, we need to be looking at more like a 70% tax on that wealth. We had that, I believe, under Ronald Reagan. 
and we had a much more equitable and healthy economy. We need to restore those protections again. Until we dropped it to 28%. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> uh, what can we do to counter the pharmaceutical lobby? Well, you know, number one, we need to get money out of elections. We need to have publicly financed elections. And I'll say, we passed this in my home state in Massachusetts. We passed it, and the Democrat, we passed it by voter referendum because the legislature wouldn't touch it. And after we passed it by a two to one majority, the Democratic legislature repealed it on a voice vote, which said to me, I did not see any future for myself. That was the nail in the coffin uh, for me with the Democratic Party. So we need to get the money out. We need to stop the revolving door. It's not rocket science how to do this. This is basic uh, democracy. These are basic values that the American people support. This is why we need an advocate in the White House who's actually lifting up what there's enormous public support for. We saw this in Bernie's campaign when he actually got seen and heard his progressive agenda was very very successful and he was winning in poll after poll in head-to-head -head matches with everybody Bernie Sanders was winning the day we're continuing that legacy all the stronger for having a revolutionary campaign in a truly revolutionary party not the counter-revolutionary party that fought that campaign and um, with all the voter fraud the email scandals uh, what's the green solution for the public to have more control over our data within the government well, we need much more transparency. Uh, we need openness in government. Uh, Barack Obama came into office saying he would do that, but he's actually been kind of the opposite of that. We need to stop our war on whistleblowers. We need to stop using the Espionage Act to uh, persecute and to harass the press. We need to have you know real investigations uh, and the power of the press to um, uh, in order to do that. Um, we need to break up the media. Uh, monopolies. We need to use antitrust laws so that we, the public, can actually be informed. And true media, you know, we have a name for the other guys. We don't call them the press, we call them the O-Press <laughs> because uh, they're not helping things. And uh, it's not rocket science about how to get our democracy in working order again. And uh, lastly, I don't want to get you in trouble with CNN since you're going on there, but why not? Uh, <laughs> do you think they should disclose uh, the fact that their parent company is the number seven donor to Hillary Clinton? You got NBC, MSNBC, Comcast held a fundraiser for her last year. I mean, there's a lots of that revolving door you're talking about. Yes. But, you know, a lot of people, most people watching wouldn't know that. Uh, do, you, do you think that there is a trust gap there? Uh, Yes, and I wouldn't limit it to CNN, you know. <laughs> I would say all of the mainstream media, you know, owes it to the public to let people know how they are messing with, um, you know, not only our communications by hijacking them, but also with the rules of the game. And, you know, this election is such a case in point. Uh, you know, Donald Trump is a product of economic misery, uh, driven in part by the policies of the Clintons, uh, but also Donald Trump is a product of the media. He had $2 billion worth of free media to compared to Hillary Clinton's one billion, compared to Bernie Sanders' roughly half of a billion, and this was months ago, so the numbers are even bigger now. So, you know, this is a real crisis for our democracy, and I think one of the lessons coming out of this race is that if we are going to avoid this slippery slope towards uh, neo-fascism, this right-wing extremism, we need to take back our democracy, and we need to take back our right to an open, free, and fair media. And uh, I lied one more. Uh, if CNN only cares about ratings, they all do. So put aside this 15% threshold you have to uh, hit, uh, according to them, to make it on to the debate stage. Uh, if it was a ratings play, what would be your message to them why they should have Dr. Jill Stein on stage? Because I know it would be entertaining, but obviously you have to sell, you know, the, uh, the producers over there. Yeah, so two things. First, um, that 15% rule isn't actually CNN's. That's the rule of the Commission on Presidential mm -hmm. Debates, and people need to know that that is a fraudulent commission. It is not a public interest commission. Uh, it's really the Democratic and Republican parties uh, who 
control the rules of the game. They can set thresholds in order to lock out political opposition. You know, that is the definition of tyranny, when you restrict uh, political debate and discussion and candidates. Not only does the Commission on Presidential Debates uh, decide the candidates and set these rules to limit discussion, they also control the moderator and therefore the kinds of questions. And what few people know is that they also control the audience. So they create this this artificial universe, you know, in which people cheer for another war, or they cheer for corporate tax breaks, or they cheer for another rigged trade agreement like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's intended to create this feeling that, you know, that, that resistance is futile, and other people think that way, so I should too. You know, it's absolutely false. And today there was a decision um, in, in a court that, uh, against our case, to open up the debates, but you know, courts have been clueless before. This isn't the first time. And this issue needs to be decided not in some clueless court of law, but in the court of public opinion. We, the public, need to stand up for open debates. And we not only have a right to vote, we have a right to know who we can vote for. And any candidate who's on the ballot in enough states that they could actually win the election Voters deserve to know that they have that choice. And in fact, there would be four candidates in this race representing the true political spectrum. Who's gonna challenge Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton on their shared views about militarism as the basis of foreign policy? Who's going to challenge them on their fossil fuel view of the world? Because Donald Trump may love coal, but Hillary Clinton loves fracking, and it's not clear that one is better than the other. You know, who's going to challenge them on, um, you know, on, on the next uh, economic crisis, on the mistreatment of workers, while Donald Trump, you know, uh, sends his jobs overseas and cheats on his workers, uh, Hillary Clinton, you know, has been part of the war against uh, labor unions. Who's going to stand up for public education, for fully funding public schools, for teaching to the whole student, for lifetime learning with enriched curriculum, with, with music and with art and with rec rec recreation, instead of this high stakes testing scam, which is used to basically close down schools in poor communities and communities of color. We need to have someone there in the debates who's there to tell the truth, who's there to raise the real issues of the American people. So I encourage people to get on board, come to my website, jill2016.com, and become a part of our campaign to open up the debates. We deserve a full and fair discussion at this time of crisis where we're not just deciding what kind of a world we're going to have, but whether we're going to have a world or not going forward. We need to stand up and create this, you know, this world that works for all of us, an America and a world that works for all of us. We need to stand up and make it happen. We are the ones we've been waiting for. To my knowledge, to my knowledge, uh, to my knowledge, the Young Turks and the Internet is not governed by this Fakakta board you're talking about. So yes. we issue right. to Hillary Clinton, to Donald Trump, yes. to you. Yes. We'll, we'll take all of you, however long, and we could do it tomorrow. So we'll see if Great. they get back Great. to us. Hopefully this, this goes far and wide, but I want to thank you very much thank for you taking so much. the time. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.